Hello everyone, and welcome to Streaming Fast and Slow, how to successfully be an early adopter of stream processing at your company, with a particular focus on integration, operations, and analytics. My name is Kato Schur, and I'm a software engineer, and I live in Portland, Oregon in the US. I have a variety of hobbies, including woodworking, dance, and running. And I first started working with stream processing in 2017 with Apache Flink. I'm here because of an experience I had as an early adopter of stream processing at my old company for a top tier project. And I want to talk about the things I learned about successfully integrating new streaming application into a complex non-streaming ecosystem on a short timeline. So I'm going to start with some background, what the challenges were, our use case. Next, I'll go over integrating stream processing into a non-streaming ecosystem which is the fun part where the people problems and tech problems really tend to go hand in hand. Next, I'll go over what we learned about operations. And lastly, I'll cover analytics, focusing on monitoring and alerting. Before we go into background, this is probably a good time to set some definitions. I'm referring to my team here as early adopters, but that can mean a lot of different things to different people. So in this context, I'm mainly referring to being the first one or first team at your company that's building a stream processing app, particularly for production use or even more specifically, the first one to use a particular framework at your company. This is also a good time to mention that unfortunately the project I'm talking about here is not open source, so please still feel free to reach out to me about it, but there are some pri proprietary things that I may not be able to talk about. Okay, so on a high level, this project was to create a new data pipeline to organize, track, and store customer usage information in a way that's highly secure and can be queried for in real time by various sources. On the logistical side, this is a top tier system that would need to interact with every product and a variety of other apps and services, particularly those involving accounts or subscriptions. In terms of people in process, there's a familiar story of a tight timeline and a small team, but this had the additional complications of also being at a company that was completely new to the framework we selected and was also relatively new to stream processing. This is an example of what customers would see, which represents usage for their account with subscriptions to various products. And this shows three of usually about seven. So this needs to be accurate because it will be closely tied with billing and it would need to be accessible in near real time because customers, sales, et cetera, may want to check their usage at any time on a really granular level. How many minutes they were connected to the product, how many CPU did they use in the last hour for another project, product, et cetera. And I feel like we already have a nice list of buzzwords going here. So I'm going to throw in some high throughput. Um, this shows just one customer here in the, in the slide who could have data for seven plus product, products, some having multiple units of measurement, data retention specifications, and subscription tiers. Add in the fact that there's a lot of metadata about a lot of this, um, and then of course multiply by a huge number of customers. So we needed a system that could handle this growth and sustainably handle it for the foreseeable future. Luckily, there's some frameworks out there that can solve for all of these challenges, which is awesome, and they can do so in really powerful and impressive ways. So problem solved, right? In the end, yeah. Um, but in order to use the features that would end up solving all of our problems, we would need to integrate this new application to a large, complex, pre-existing system that may not be prepared at all for the impact of a powerful, fast stream processing framework um, that you're adding into it. So we knew this that we would need to compensate for certain operational costs like storage capacity for storing state since we picked Apache Flink, storing save points uh, since those don't normally get cleared up by the framework. However, we may not have been prepared for how much we needed to factor in the use cases of our dependent upstream and downstream apps into our program design and configuration. So why streaming fast and slow? First, I want to talk about speed. One of the reasons people love some of the most popular stream processing frameworks is because they optimize for low latency and can consume data obscenely fast. Both Apache Flink and Apache Spark, for instance, can process tens of millions of records per second, which of course is awesome. So these frameworks can enable you to stream data through a top speed. Cool. But this means that the first problem that we encountered was as the engineer or engineering team, how do you keep up with something that's that, that's that fast? <clears throat> to me, it was kind of like training for a big sporting event, uh, like a marathon for your first time. Uh, I actually had a great example of this happen to me last August in the before times when you could go outside with people in large groups. 
Um, as I mentioned, one of my hobbies is running and I signed up for a multiple day relay race with thousands of other runners across half the state of Oregon. I also may have signed up late and had about two weeks to train. So it was, ended up being a very appropriate analogy. Uh, the race was like nothing I'd ever done before. I would need to run on multiple different types of terrain and different temperatures and times of day. I would need to navigate areas I'd never been to and coordinate with lots of other people running before and after me. And I would need to be able to integrate well with the streams of people running alongside me and on other routes at different paces intersecting with mine. I had to come to terms with the fact that just because I'm a runner does not mean I'm prepared for this special kind of race. Just like how, just because my team was full of talented engineers and had healthy applications didn't mean that we were automatically prepared for jumping in and keeping up with a new, super fast stream processing framework at that scale. But it also didn't mean that we couldn't do it, or even that we couldn't do it on that tight timeline. It just meant that we had to be extra cognizant of a few critical things before we started. In both scenarios, it wasn't just about understanding stream processing or being a skilled engineer or athlete. It was about how much of the teams around you understood the process and how well you understood your impact on the others in order to really integrate that successfully. For the relay race, I had to completely reevaluate how I trained. I had to prepare to integrate the aspects of running I was familiar with into a large complicated event that involved lots of other teams running in parallel to us. I would need to run in a way that could be made compatible with their processes and meet the standards of the event system as a whole. My team had to be aware of the running patterns and understand how to address issues that came up with the teams that we were running upstream of us on the route. And in both situations, we had to strengthen some communication processes within the team, but more importantly, we had to be able to communicate well with other teams that we wouldn't normally be interacting with on a normal daily jog, just because by nature of there being such an ongoing stream of runners and that stream contained so many runners, we had to recognize that our presence would now be impacting them in ways that we had not before. I also had to invest in completely new running gear. My old gear and other resources that I'd used in the past had been fine when I was running only in small batches, but they may not be able to hold up to this new situation. When I'm running in small batches, with time to stop, check my progress, refuel or readjust, there are certain resources I can just skip if they're inconvenient, like wearing the right shoes, even getting the right fuel or rehydration. But of course, if you're running anything continuously, you have to figure out ways to check your progress and adjust your gear while you're still running. And of course, to be able to do that often if needed and sustainably. So even if my old gear did miraculously hold up for such a seemingly endless stream of running, is it worth it for it to just merely hold up? Or is it worth investing in resources that you feel confident will be able to scale with you, ones that can really keep up to your full potential for power and speed? And of course, having to adequately test the resources, making sure they're selecting the best ones and the best configurations. Uh, additionally, in this situation, we'd be running through uncharted territory with no cell phone reception, as in no existing way to track our progress for that area. So we need to reevaluate how we monitored our runner's health and speed and how we could alert on any potential stops in progress or other related issues. So in this analogy, maybe you're a really experienced engineer. Maybe you've even worked with some other really powerful, fast, really athletic streaming frameworks before. Maybe your applications are really healthy and they've been in good enough shape to accommodate other really impressive changes and new technologies. The engineering team that I was on was also comprised of experienced engineers who had dealt with a lot of really new and different things, and most of our applications were also in really good shape. However, just like in the relay race, we found that in order to keep up with the speed of stream processing, particularly one as powerful as Flink, and especially when integrating our new service into something so large and complex, we still had to really slow down and make some serious adjustments to how we normally went about that process. We had to be particularly careful in this case about how we impacted the tech ecosystem around us. Could the non-streaming sources upstream of us and downstream apps and our sync, where, where the data ends up, in our case, internal data stores, be able to handle this new continuous stream? And could the ecosystem of people and teams around us be able to troubleshoot any issues that come up if they're unfamiliar with stream processing or Flink concepts? We had to drastically adjust our gear our resources like our container configurations, memory allocation, etc. And this one seems obvious because of course you'd want to accommodate a higher amount of data that you'd be expecting to receive. 
you want to set yourself up for scaling upwards and you know but in this case we had to be extra clear with stakeholders and others that might be in charge of say approving the resources we've requested especially if they're unfamiliar with stream processing that we may actually need more resources than just that but also we may likely need more ownership of those resources than before so you know or whoever was in charge of those resources that person would also need to be familiar with stream processing i'll get into that later so we would need to be able to allocate extra resources and have more autonomy over them to be able to handle potential data spikes and if the stream stops and restarts unexpectedly and any other issues that we hadn't really had to deal with when we were processing data in batches which we as the engineers who have researched stream processing would understand but again it's really about understanding who else in your ecosystem is aware of that um, finally we were in uncharted territory since we couldn't just stop and examine a well-defined batch of data once it already been processed or wait until the records are successfully written out to our data store at the very end of the pipeline, we would need to find better ways of looking inside the pipeline to monitor our throughput latency and any other potential unexpected stops or spikes before they become an issue. And again, this seems really obvious, um, but I want to really emphasize the scale that we're dealing with here and just how much more that complicates it. So this was a particularly important uh, issue since many of the teams, we had so many different teams that interacted with us and that were writing out to our pipeline as well. So starting with integration, um, as for integrating into the technical ecosystem, this is a sad one. Uh, some of the best features of stream processing for your team can also be the biggest drawbacks for teams that interact with you, which is ouch. <laughs> So firstly, if you're unifying streams of data owned by different teams, you may have, you may find that some of those teams who thought they all treated their data the same, maybe don't. Um, so we found that it's best to assume that all of these teams upstream of you may be treating their data differently. And, and of course, to make sure to have those conversations early in the process. So in our case, we had really specific needs for aggregating data and exactly what that needed to look like. So not all teams were able to implement logic fast enough on their ends to sufficiently adhere to our schema before launch. Again, this is for a project that's on a tight timeline. So how do you be successful in that shorter amount of time? So we had to factor that into our time and design. Uh, we actually ended up creating a second Flink app that provided all the aggregation calculations on the data that still needed it. Um, but this wasn't just an issue of extra engineering hours spent on coding. This meant we now had a complicated ownership problem. We had to get really creative about how we split up who owned pre-aggregated data for which teams and subsequently who was responsible for alerting and monitoring on it. This in turn meant that we had to become a lot more familiar with another team's domain in order to have context for even the small slice of their system that we were monitoring for. And I want to emphasize that for some of the biggest hurdles we had, the best resolutions came from really slowing down and talking with those upstream and downstream teams really optimizing for our understanding of our impact on each other's domains and letting that data inform our architecture and design process. Otherwise, you could end up at the last minute with data in a form that's unusable for you, or you could end up with no one wanting to take ownership of monitoring and consequently insufficient insight into your data and worse, insufficient alerting. And this leads to some other related issues. Oops with the, uh, did not skip ahead, with being an early adopter. And part of that is I want to talk about creating and automating community within our, within your company for the stream processing framework that you've selected. And basically how this was really one of the best ways we found to mitigate some of those roadblocks. This was helpful because as I mentioned, we were impacting teams in ways that we had not impacted them before. We were also using shared resources like AWS buckets and internal container and deployment tools in a way that they had never been used before either. This meant we needed to understand other teams' applications much better than we'd normally have to, but it also meant that other teams and leaders, architects, etc., suddenly needed to be familiar with our monitoring, as well as be familiar with some basic stream processing and Flink concepts so they could understand our monitoring. So what do I mean by automating an internal community? Okay, so if we address each inter-team related issue as it comes up, this would be a long and painful process and it would keep us away from our engineering work. So we found that the heart of most of these issues were the same, engineers having to repeatedly advocate for or explain our system or Flink concepts to others. 
This meant, though, that we could easily automate resolution for these issues and make a virtuous cycle of information sharing through creating things like a safe space for others to experiment with stream processing in our case Flink, as well as providing interactive documentation and, of course, a good detailed map. So here's where the running analogy gets a little too literal. So my team for the relay race were also my coworkers in a different org, though. So my running team and my engineering team both use the same internal platform to both create blog posts that both cover the same two topics, um, including we both had how-to manuals for anyone who was interested in either training like my running team or creating their own Flink cluster and how to integrate that with the internal tools at that company. We each also had an overview for the project with a glossary of terms, which was really helpful. Uh, and the blog format, of course, was chosen specifically so that people from other teams, leadership, et cetera, could ask questions or even give advice in the comments. Super simple, super effective. Um, sharing these posts saved us so much time and having to explain what the heck we were working on in both cases. So as for supporting experimentation, both for the launch of the relay race and for our new streaming application, my team in both situations created accessible chat rooms to support people who were experimenting with and wanting to get help for something that was new for them. In both cases, people would ask each other questions about what resources, progress monitoring tools, and other things that people were used that were related. People would ask if others wanted to collaborate on training sessions together. They would encourage others for how well their sessions went and commiserated when an experiment failed. This sounds basic because it is super basic, but it was an incredibly important baseline for us that enabled us to cultivate a group of people who felt comfortable doing their own work to become more knowledgeable and became increasingly more enthusiastic about participating and helping each other out. In the end, my team was able to lean on them a lot uh, and lean on this whole community that we had built. And they were able to help us out and actually get us unstuck on a lot of real problems, really big problems um, later on in the project. So it was huge. And I couldn't share the internal work Slack, but here's a screenshot from the Slack space for the running team. Um, so just replace elevation gain with records per second and miles with Kafka topics, and you could, you could basically swap those two out. <laughs> Thirdly, always take a map. In both scenarios, this wasn't just about having a math, map of the pathway from start to finish, but it was essential that we clarify the integration points along the way so other teams could quickly assess where they were and who they impacted in case of an emergency. Again, it's all about making this very efficient and easy to read. So with each more detailed iteration uh, of our map, uh, other teams that interacted us, with us were able to become more and more autonomous, giving us more time to work on our engineering work. Another essential map that we used in both cases was a flowchart for incident response and triage. If you get lost in the woods and end up running in a circle, which did happen to someone, or your Flink application stops and instead of restarting successfully, it begins to cycle for minutes on end, scary stuff. Um, in both scenarios, the incident response flowcharts were ridiculously simple because that's exactly what you need if you get lost in three in the morning, either way. Which brings us to operations. Most people here probably have a good idea of the main operational drawbacks, drawbacks and risks of stream processing, like storage. Particularly with frameworks like Flink, where you might be storing things like save points in a different way that you're storing elements like your state, sna state snapshots. Most well-architected stream processing frameworks have some features or workarounds that make this pretty easily remedied though. We even planned ahead for this project um, for how well that Flink specifically would integrate technically with the tools that we'd be using and had support for. A lot of our choices had to do with how well it could integrate with things like Mesos and Zookeeper. However, because this was a large company with lots of operations separated into specialized teams, we still had issues with the fact that just because these tools are technically compatible didn't mean that they were configured in a way that was gonna be really helpful to us. It also meant that we had no control over reconfiguring them. And they might be a shared resource, in which case configuration would be slow and involve a lot of completely unrelated teams as well. Internal deployment tools are probably the most common example for this and something that we did have to find a workaround for. Since we didn't own them and deployment is used by just about every team, reconfiguring them for just our use case was, was and would be a very arduous process. 
We worked around this by creating and owning a deploy script in the beginning so that we, get, we could get started and still be able to deploy and, and be able to iterate quickly. And we did that while we were working on a more automated long-term solution, which we were eventually able to do. And at first we manually uploaded the script and that was something we were able to hook into the tools using a hook that we wrote as well. So there was a lot that went in there for um, creating this uh, on our team from scratch. So lastly, analytics. With the running analogy, it was important to make sure that monitoring was well coordinated between teams and our stakeholders. In this case, in the running case, stakeholders could be the rest of your team who's ahead or behind you, or it could be your family who's following your progress on a running app that's streaming your GPS signal to them in real time, which was pretty cool. During the relay race, my stakeholders, which was my family, were remotely following my progress on the app. And when my progress stopped and disappeared suddenly at three in the morning with no way of alerting them, um, that was some pretty unhappy stakeholders. And none of us wants unhappy stakeholders. So although my team learned that we needed better monitoring for our running routes, kind of like our, a pipeline, it helped that the, the team at least knew what the normal pace was for each runner, which gave them a reasonable threshold to know when to alert if a certain duration of time had passed without seeing a runner exit the pipeline. Luckily, the engineering team made several features to compensate for this, including creating unique fields of key data on just for within the pipeline. In the stream processing scenario, stakeholders often ended up being teams that own the applications upstream and downstream of us. As I said earlier, we found that we had to be much more familiar with particularly our upstream applications than we'd ever needed to be for our old batch applications. And this is particularly true for applications that may have really sensitive alerting around increases or pauses in data flow, especially if their way of alerting and what they want to alert on is not totally aligned with what you're looking for. Um, and again, that might sound obvious, but it was something that we really had to pause and take a, a pretty solid look at. So if you're relying on their alerting to signify any issues that might legitimately impact your pipeline, definitely a great opportunity for collaborating on that and reevaluating that. So for ensuring that these teams understood our monitoring, uh, most of that was about 45 minutes of relabeling our dashboards and posting them in our stakeholder Slack. So ended up being pretty efficient actually. So for instance, we may need to monitor spikes in data from a particular source, like one of our incoming Kafka topics, but the data coming in from that source only affects one of our downstream teams. So if we wanted to be nice and, and keep things really efficient, we wanted to make sure that it was really clear in the labeling so that only that team would know that it affected them. And also that they would absolutely know that it, that they should be paying attention to it as well. So they wouldn't miss it. And uh, earlier, going back to the, the running analogy. So in that several day relay race, those issues like unexpected stops in progress could signify a really serious issue. So it was imperative to have a way to monitor and alert on this. It was also important to understand, as I said earlier, the typical pace of a runner or in the stream processing case, it's important to know what normal looks like for your application. And I don't just mean kind of a good enough gut feeling, but really making sure the whole team understands what normal is on a very granular level. We also found that for all of our older projects and all the other um, non-streaming applications that we started from scratch, really only the team needed to know what normal looked like. And for this situation, we found that a lot more stakeholders, architects, etc., also needed to be made aware of what normal looks like because it's just going to have that much wider of an impact. So, um, it doesn't really have to be that complicated is what we found. So what I have here in these slides is a bit of an oversimplified example, but we've got three products that were upstream of us represented here. In this situation, 910 to 915 time spike was normal, but we only knew that was normal by talking to those upstream teams. And we also found that just knowing what normal is and just saying, okay, I've checked that box. I know what it is. I'm going to put it in documentation or whatever isn't always enough because what if they change their schedule? Or what if one team's products event time processing is based in UTC and the other in PST? Uh, most of these things were not a problem until we started combining those data streams into one pipeline. Uh, also, what if one of those time zones does daylight savings and one doesn't? So finding those things out ahead of time was incredibly helpful 
Um, and it's really about, again, not just finding what normal is now, but what normal is going to look like in the future, what normals look like in the past and keeping an eye on if normal changes and how long of a period of time means normal and what is good and bad in that situation. So, um, again, that normal spike might move in the future. So it's really about understanding what there as in the upstream teens threshold for alerting is and how that's going to impact you. Um, and it's again, it's about ensuring if you're monitoring the right metrics and what you're doing to ensure you know what those metrics not being correct means. So in this one, we actually had some debates. Um, again, this is just an example, but it's an example of basically a real life thing of, you know, we had the threshold a little bit higher. So it was actually above that, the spike that's in red. Um, and the upstream teams let us know, like, no, this actually really matters. That spike is bad. We want to make sure that we are alerting on that the instant it comes up there, even though that same spike is perfectly fine if it happens within the 910 to 915 range. So it's really understanding about where that threshold is for those teams and not just about for, for your pipeline as well. Um, so yeah, like, are there daily spikes that are okay? And, uh, and again, this example, I think one of these was that that app did that team's app did write like on a once a day batch. So it's all very good stuff to know. And in both scenarios, seeing a slowdown in progress might actually be okay, but it's all about the fact that you want to calculate a threshold to alert on based on that normal and based on what abnormally slow is for that particular, uh, application or data stream or that runner. And so, you know, when you really need to start getting concerned. So in the end, uh, I love working with stream processing because it can be so incredibly fast. Frameworks like Apache Flink, Spark, and Kafka streams have amazing features that can, and, and honestly, genuinely for us did, solve a lot of really big, complicated problems. However, keeping up with something that fast and powerful can definitely take some creative readjustments to integrate if you're uh, putting that into a pre-existing non-streaming system. Uh, take it from me though, when you speed through that finish line, totally worth it. So with that, thank you so much, everyone. And I'm really looking forward to meeting you all in the social and in the Slack space. So come say hi. And a special thank you to Berlin Buzzwords, Haystack, MyCs, and uh, all the event staff. And um, yeah, big thanks. So thank you, everyone, uh, to join uh, the session with Kaido. Hi. Uh, so feel free to post any questions on the channel uh, vbaz1 or directly uh, message to her. And uh, yeah, Kaido. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, very much for moderating this. This was awesome. Uh, very surreal to watch myself talk. <laughs> uh, that was super fun. And yeah, feel free to post up in the channel. Um, I, as I, as Martina mentioned, I won't be able to join the breakout session, um, but I'm here for the conference and I'll be at all the socials and like, seriously, please feel free to reach out to me over Slack or the, the Brella meetings. Uh, I promise I'm friendly. <laughs>